morning. My name is Stacy Sousa. I have a Bachelor of Jurisprudence from the University of Namibia, as well as a Bachelor of Laws from the same university. And after I completed that degree, I went on to South Africa to do my Master's in International Trade Law, and I'm registered at the same institution for my PhD in International Trade Law. I am currently lecturing at the University of Namibia. I lecture a few courses there. And I say currently because I have conditioned my mind to know, understand, and accept that I am great. So wherever I am today is well on my way to greatness. Just to start off, do me a favor, close your eyes. Can you go back to a point in your life that you achieved something exceptional? And now that you're going back, you realize that you achieved that thing not because of your educational qualifications, but something else in you, something else inside you set you apart. Open your eyes. If you were able to find such a moment, that thing is called a gift. It allowed you to be set apart. What is a gift? Merriam-Webster says the following, a gift is one of two things, or four things. One, it is a notable capacity, it is talent, it is a special ability, it is endowment. How does this gift work? David Hassel, the CEO of 15.5 and a personal believer in using one's gift, says the following, you know that you are using your gift when, while you are using it, number one, you lose all sense of time, Number two, you are more energized than before. Number three, others wonder how were you able to do it so easily. You see, a gift is not something you can easily determine. Why? It comes very naturally. It is part of who you are. It is something you do almost without applying your mind to it. But because you don't know that it is your gift and that the next person does not have the same ability, you do not appreciate it as your gift. Why is this gift important? Why is it important to use one's gift? You see, many other times in life, we focus on a whole lot of other things, things that we have weaknesses in, things that we have strength in. But when you focus on your gift, remember I said it's a special ability. It is notable capacity. That means in each one of us, there is a special ability to do certain things that the next person is not so easily able to do. That means when you focus on it, you will excel because you are the only person that can execute that gift better than anyone else. A few weeks ago, I was on my usual quest of finding out what was it about my life that can set me apart and put my work above the average. It is not because I feel I'm better than anyone else or I'm proud or whatever the reason may be, but I realized that the world needs that much more excellence. If I'm able to apply my mind to a gift that I have, I'm able to excel. And that is what the world needs for the change that we require for today's life. So ordinarily, the world says education is the key to success. I went to look at my degrees. Was it my Bachelor in Jurisprudence? Was it my Bachelor of Laws? No. Was it the fact that I have a Master's? Definitely not. Was it the fact that I'm doing my PhD? Definitely not. Why? because I'm not the first or the last person in this life that will ever have those qualifications. Somebody else before me has had them, somebody else after me will have them. So already I knew that whatever it was that could set me apart had to be from the inside. It had to be something only I had the ability to do. That when I'm in a room with anyone else, that thing will set me apart because it's unique to my nature. It's unique to my persona. So I decided, I'm going to embark on a journey and look at a few moments that defined my life. Number one, before we get to my personal moments, I called a lady the day that I realized I'm going to do the TED, TED talk, and I said to her, ma'am, she's an old lecturer of mine, and we have a good relationship. And I said to her, I want to make specific reference to your life, because you will see later on how she has used her gift. And she said to me, Stacy, TEDx is meant to inspire. If you're going to go there and not use your life experience to ins inspire somebody, then please don't use my life as an example. So what are you talking about? I gave her a brief and she said to me, okay, go ahead. And she told me what her gift was. So I hope that in me letting you in into my life and those moments that defined and changed things, you'll be able to, inspire, to be inspired. That's my mom and my dad. Back, back in the day. You can see it's a 1960-something picture. 
1997, I was in grade six, and in my country, you write your exams in grade seven for you to go to grade eight. So I was in grade six, and my mom said, you know what? There's something about you. I want you to write, attempt your exams in grade six, and then I know you will make it and go to grade eight. I said, okay. I was young, didn't know anything from anything, but because my mother said so, I did it. I wrote my exams, and off I went into grade eight. I was the second youngest person in my class. 2000, that's me, fourth girl on, from your right. Young, ambitious, optimistic about the future. So what happened here is this, that one day, the classrooms were being renovated. So we had to move all of our classes to the science laboratories. So the teachers didn't want to spend a lot of time in there. So they would come in, give us work, walk away, and come back and check how we did. So that day, they teamed us up, put us in teams, and said, OK, tackle this work. She went away, and when the teacher is away, you're free to discuss certain answers. So we talked about some answers, and then the class was almost at consensus that the answer was a certain one. And I said to my teammate, I said, Abigail, that is not the answer. This is the correct answer. And she said to me, Stacy, no, but everyone's writing this answer. I said, I don't care. This is the correct answer, and I'll defend us. Teacher came back. Long story short, our answer was correct. You should have seen Abigail's face beam up with such pride when two seconds ago she was almost about ready to throttle me because I was not conforming. Fast track to 2003. I was 16, I had just finished high school, and I had three things. My birth certificate, my national registration card, and my testimonial for my career as master. And I decided I'm not going to take this gap year as the world dictates. I want to work. So I approached one of the biggest firms in my town. They do destination management. And I approached them for a job in the reservations department, a British woman. She looked at me and she said, you're young and you have no experience, and we don't want to take the risk. We don't want to have to bring you in and have to train you all over again. And I, I concurred with her somewhat. But during the interview, I did not fail to make myself clear on who I was. And I said to her, look, I know I'm young, and I know I have no the, don't have the experience you want. But if you give me the chance, I would do the job. Anyway, I didn't get the job. First contact with society, and I was turned away. A few days later, she calls me back. Stacy, I know we had a lot of applicants, ones that were even experienced as compared to you. But there's something about you that we're willing to work with. Second person that told me there was something about me. Long story short, I got the job. I was the youngest person in that company. And in that year, I got employee of the year. Fast track to 2013, what, February 2008. What happened here is that I had my fair share of work. I worked and, you know, amassed a bit of money, but I decided and I knew inside me that with this desire to be great, I need an education. It won't be enough one day down the line for me to just say I've been working. I need an education. So I was deciding and considering where to study, what to study, et cetera. And some of my friends at the university said to me, Stacy, I know you want to apply to UNAM, but please bear in mind, for international students, the requirements are much higher. They're stringent. I said, OK. So they said, OK, so maybe you might not get into the school that you want. Mistake number one, I let that define me, and I settled. I settled for any faculty that could take me, even though my grades would allow me into another faculty. So where did I end up? I was doing industrial psychology and um, economics. One of the worst years of my life. Why? I do not like mathematics from a very young age. So ordinarily, my report card looked like A's on one end, economics, psychology, all the theory stuff, distinctions. Come mathematics. Not such a brilliant story. What did that do to me? It knocked me down. Because it was the first time my mental capacity was being challenged. I did not know myself as a failure ever, and so I started to punish myself mentally. If only back then I had focused on mathematics, today I would not be settling. It took a serious toll on my confidence, so that made me make a decision. Either I quit school or change faculties. I decided I'm going to get into law school. Came back 2008, and at registration, I went to see this lady, very tough lady. If I told you the name, you'd probably know. She's not in the faculty anymore, but she's 
you know, rules are rules. You do as they say. And she said to me, look, I'd love to help you, but you have arrears from your old module. That means you cannot get into law school. I tried, begged, pleaded, convinced. She said, look, I can't help you. If you want, go and see the dean. He might listen to you. But I realized that she was only saying that to dismiss me. You know, go and see the dean if you want. But I said, you know what? You don't realize, but today you have started to define the shape of my destiny. I took it upon myself, went to see the man. Imagine this. Freshman, foreign country, you do not know what's what. You don't, you don't even know the corridors of the university quite properly. And there you have to face a big man, no nonsense, and convince him to give you a shot. I sat opposite him and I spoke to him. And he was looking at me so intently. And after the talk, he says to me, you know what? You speak well and you're confident. There's something about you. I'm going to give you a chance. He wrote me a note, and today I would not be standing here had it not been for that moment. 2013, I went to South Africa to do my master's. And um, what happened there is that it was a two-year program. I was in a bursary. And so I had to do my modules and my dissertation all in two years, but I decided I'm going to do it in a year. My modules were on point, my thesis was suffering, and at one point I particularly did not like the comments that my supervisor was making on my script. So I said, I'm going to see him. Made an appointment and I sat and I said to him, Prof, I feel like there's something wrong here. We're not quite understanding each other. I'm not comfortable with the comments you're making on my paper. Is there something wrong? And he says to me, no, Stacy, I didn't mean to offend you. But maybe you should just, you know, take a break, go home, have Christmas, come back next year. You can always finish your thesis. I said, okay, thank you very much. I walked off. That year I finished my master's. And the next year I registered for my PhD. Through all these experiences, you might ask, what is your gift? I'm tenacious. I don't give up. I do not let circumstance or opinion change or redefine the greatness that I know that is in me. How does that help me? Because I'm such a believer in myself, and I myself am convinced of the place that I have on the face of the earth, when I open my mouth to speak, I naturally am able to convince the other person. I'm naturally able to make them a believer of me because I myself am confident of that place in my life. I'll show you a few examples. The lady I was referring to, Yvonne Dalsab. She's the head of the Law Reform Commission of Namibia and was recently appointed on President Hagi Henhob's A-Team. And the A-team is basically a few intellectual minds that give the president advice on issues pertaining to the country. She is my old lecturer, friend, mentor, and she's the one that said to me, inspire somebody with my story. Next lady on the far right is Ms. Ngipondoka Robiati. She is the chief executive officer of the Namibia Trade Forum, an agency of the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and SME Development. And I spoke to these two ladies on two different occasions. But afterwards, I sat down and I looked at something. They have gifts that are almost similar, but those gifts have allowed them to excel in their field of work. These two ladies are humble. What you see is what you get. They have no airs and graces about them. She walk into the room, you will not think twice about it, but speak to her, you will realize that it's somebody with power. Not a lot of people have that gift. Most times when we're enabled to enjoy a certain amount of power, it gets to your head. And suddenly everyone must recognize who you are when you walk into the room. Guess what? It's distasteful. But people want to work with somebody that is humble. These two ladies are also teachable. They are high ranking, but they will never fail to ask for an opinion, even from me, that has just finished school and trying to find my feet in the world. They will sit down and listen. It is not a quality that a lot of people have. The President of the Republic of Namibia. He has a special gift. I don't know this because I know him personally, but I know because I can see how he manages his government. He's a great listener. He listens. Had he not been able to listen, today would not have managed to find a solution for the affirmative repositioning issue that has been going on in Namibia. People have legitimately wanted more access to land, and our president listened. He's sitting with the pioneer of that movement, and later on, they're shaking hands. It's sorted, because our president has the gift of listening. 
How are you able to find this gift? Number one, you need to do three things. You need to know, understand, and accept that on the face of this earth, you are the only one of your kind that has ever walked this earth. There will never be another person like you. Be it two, three, four thousand years from now, there will only be one you on the face of this earth. What does that mean? In you is a special ability to do certain things, and those abilities are linked to your purpose here in life. So you need not compete with anyone. Know that in you is the ability already that sets you apart from the next person. Number two, sit down and do an inventory of your life. Look at those times in your life that you defined yourself or you excelled. And I don't mean marriage, graduation day, the ordinary stuff, world order. Those things that you know that now that when you look back, they had absolutely nothing to do with your education. It was something in you that came out and allowed you to excel. Chances are that is where your gift lies. Number three, nurture it. That gift will set you apart. Thank you. Thank you.